The following is a talk given online by Professor Barron on February 20th, 2024, hosted by the Writing Center and the AI and the Liberal Arts Initiative. Scan the QR codes on screen to learn more or go to www.liberal-arts.ai. And um, as you can imagine, the staff in the Writing Center have been curious and at times worried um, about the, this confluence. What's the value in teaching and practicing writing today? Um, how can we support students fa and faculty in this new chapter of, the, of this dance between creative work and technology? So I am so excited to introduce Naomi S. Barron, whose research engages these questions from multiple angles. Naomi S. Barron is Professor Emerita of Linguistics at American University in Washington, DC. She is a former Guggenheim Fellow, Fulbright Fellow, and visiting scholar at the Stanford Center for Advanced Study in the Behavioral Sciences. For more than 30 years, she has been studying the effects of technology on language, including the ways we speak, read, write, and think. Her earlier books include Words on Screen, The Fate of Reading in a Digital World, that came out in 2015, and How We Read Now, Strategic Choices for Print, Screen, and Audio, uh, which came out in 2021. Her newest book is entitled Who Wrote This? How AI and the Lure of Efficiency Threaten Human Writing, and appeared September 2023. Um, and so I would like to turn off my mic and and uh, introduce you all uh, to Naomi S. Barron. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Jessica. And it's a delight to see all the rest of you sort of in these little postage stamp size pictures. Um, I'm going to talk about AI and creativity, and then later we will talk about it, um, and why that matters for humans. I'm going to apologize. The technology was not my friend today and I couldn't do my own slides. Don't ask me why, but I couldn't. So next slide, please. So what I'd like to do is introduce the topic by reading you a few things. Uh, the first two of which are in belated honor of Valentine's Day. And the second um, will relate to the brothers Karamazov. So first Valentine's Day, love letters. Here's one. My sympathetic affection beautifully attracts your affectional enthusiasm. You were my loving adoration, my breathless adoration. My fellow feeling breathlessly hopes for your eager, your dear eagerness. My lovesick adoration cherishes your avid ardor, yours wistfully. And here's the second. My beloved. Your presence lights up even the darkest corners of my world. Your touch ignites a fire within me that never fades. With every heartbeat, I am reminded of the depth of my love for you, a love that knows no bounds, forever and always. The first of those love letters was written in the early 1950s on a computer called the Ferranti Mark I that took up a whole room that was humongous and was programmed by an early computer scientist named Christopher Strachey. The second was um, written by ChatGPT, Flavor 3.5, because I have not paid the bucks to OpenAI, uh, and I crafted two weeks ago. You can hear the difference in quality. But what about things not written uh, as love letters? What about things written by student essays. And I'd like to read you a little bit from an essay, not by a student, but by a professor of Russian literature named Eric Nyman that appeared in the Times Literary Supplement in January 26th of this year. Nyman wrote, in 30 years of teaching at Berkeley, that's the University of California at Berkeley, I have read thousands of undergraduate essays, but until recently, I didn't think any of my students had ever used the word delve. As I read their compositions on the Brothers Karamazov this past fall, however, I saw that things had changed. One student wrote, this essay delves into the theme of masculinity by focusing on two central figures, Ivan and Alyosha 
Karamasov. The next writes, Dostoevsky delves into the destructiveness of obsessive passions. Third student, David McDuff's translation of Fyodor Dostoevsky's The Brothers Karamazov delves into the moral and existential crises of 19th century Russia. And a fourth, this novel is more than a family saga. It delves into the existential and social and societal crises of 19th century Russia. The villain, and now I'm reading from Nyman's essay, the villain, of course, was ChatGPT. Of 36 students taking my upper level class on Dostoevsky, eight made such extensive use of the terminology that it was easy to spot. You don't need an AI detection program. As Justice Potter Stewart of the United States Supreme Court said years ago about something else, I know it when I see it. Vladimir Dimokov defined that something else, it was pornography, as quote, the copulation of cliches, which gets ChatGPT's approach to literature about right. I thought that was well phrased. But cliches do not make for creativity when it comes for writing. What does? And how much do we, or should we, as writers care? To explore these questions, what I'd like to do is step back before we get to writing and think about larger issues of creativity. Next slide, please. Next slide. So an overview of the topics I'd like to address. What counts as creativity? What sorts of things is AI capable of? Where does the question of authenticity come in? Meaning what is the source of where we got that creative stuff in this case? What about agency? In this case, human agency. How much does it matter that creativity comes from us and what does creativity do to us as humans? And then zeroing in on writing, particularly talking about collaboration and choices and challenges and a few final thoughts. Next slide, please. What counts as creative? Well, if you start reading the literature and creativity and it's huge, you come up with a number of different, I would say different definitions, but they're really different aspects of creativity. Uh, all of these comments come from psychologists, psychologist Jerome Bruner, who did lots of work in child psychology. He defined creativity as an act that produces effective surprise. I didn't expect this. Other people have talked about the value of what is produced. So Mahali uh, Sixth Mihaly said, value is what other people think is valuable. And in particular, he talked about creativity being something that changes some aspect of our culture. Another way of looking at this question of value was articulated by another psychologist, Morris Stein, who talked about that which is tenable or useful or satisfying to a group of people at a particular point in time. And that notion of point in time is important because in various aspects of creativity, our understanding of whether something is creative or not changes. There are times when Shakespeare was not seen as being a particularly good writer. Um, another example this time from the art world is the work of Vincent van Gogh in the 1913 Armory Show in New York, a um, long time ago. His work was badly panned. Uh, subsequently, we'll just say it was not. Next slide, please. How do you know what counts as creative? In the 1950s, a person named Joy Guilford, um, was male, <laughs> um, was the president of the American Psychological Association. He said, we have to be able to measure something if we want to be able to talk about creativity as something that's a human psychological ability. One of the tests he came up with was the difference between what was called divergent versus convergent thinking. So divergent thinking is being able to come up with alternative answers to questions or solutions to problems. Whereas convergent is homing in on a single answer or solution. And the theory of Guilford and a number of others at the time was that people who were creative did more divergent thinking. One of Guilford's colleagues, another psychologist named Ellis Torrance built an actual test for testing creativity in a number of dimensions, one of which was divergent versus convergent thinking. So a, a sample um, of what counts as divergent thinking 
how many things can you use a brick for? Well, you could build a wall, you could throw it at someone, you could, at least in my days, build bookcases because you didn't have money to go and buy them. So you get some planks of wood and you get bricks and you pile them up and you have a place to store your books. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so then there's the question of, well, is AI creative? What are the different domains in which we might think about creativity? So I'll just go through these very briefly. If you're interested in any of the examples, you can look them up. I know you're all good researchers and know how to do that. Uh, in the auditory world, one of the first places AI was used was to create music. And one of the easiest places to do that, that's in quotation marks for e the word easy, is Bach fugues. Because a fugue has a very clear set of procedures for how you construct it. And Bach wrote so many of them, it's hard to know whether the one that was created by a computer was actually created by a computer if you don't know all of Bach's fugues. Uh, more uh, intriguing is an attempt a few years ago to create Beethoven's 10th symphony. Yes, he only wrote nine, but he started at 10th and then he died. He didn't fulfill his contract for finishing the symphony. And there was an attempt to finish the symphony by feeding in Beethoven's other symphonies. You can look it up. You'll find, you can listen to it as a matter of fact and decide for yourself whether it sounds like Beethoven. Uh, then in the auditory world, there's speech. There's taking text and going to speech. Uh, so that happens when you write a book and then you say, I want to have a computer rather than a human being narrate the book. Uh, please have humans do it. It's so much better. There are audio fakes. In the visual world, you have still pictures where you can create something that didn't exist. Uh, there's a project, there was a project called The Next Rembrandt, again, you could look it up, of taking Rembrandt's works and asking if there were another painting of Rembrandt that we somehow hadn't discovered yet, what might it look like? And the uh, articulation that came out was fairly impressive. You've probably heard of Midjourney, you've heard of Dolly 2 and 3 and so forth that can create uh, uh, still pictures from words. But these days you can also do video and animation. If you've been following the latest news, you know that OpenAI has just, well, it hasn't quite released except for a small number of people, uh, a tool called Sora which takes text and creates a one minute video. That's impressive stuff. But then there are also video fakes and there are videos that could re replace um, human actors, which is one of the reasons that the uh, Screen Actors Guild uh, went on strike. And then we get to the written word as a venue for creativity. One of the well-used early tools for doing this was a program called PseudoWrite, uh, which was based on GPT-3. And then there's ChatGPT3, which was ChatGPT, which was GPT 3.5, and now it's 4.0 if you pay the money and so forth, and all the other tools like it that can create language. Next slide, please. So when it comes to language, is it the case that you can get creative using AI? Uh, a study was recently done. I've got the authors up there if you're interested in looking it up. Uh, asking if you were to have GPT-4 take the Torrance tests of creativity, how would it do? So those are language-based tests and it scored in the top 1% for originality and fluency and had high scores for flexibility. There are a whole range of tests uh, that are available and they did better than almost all humans. Now, it's also the case that if you look at the other uses of first it was GPT-3 and then it was 3.5 and now it's 4, in taking standardized tests of varying sorts, whether it was, can you pass the Turing test? How do you do on the GRE verbal? What about the bar exam? What about medical licensing? These days, GPT-4 does better than most humans do. So a lot of people are saying, well, maybe those are not good tests of human ability. So some of these abilities obviously are not creativity, but it's a whole question of are standardized tests good tests for humans of whatever it is you want to measure. Next slide, please. An issue that I think a lot about when I think about AI and creativity is authenticity. Asking, do we care whether something is made by a machine or made by hand? or by a human. So think about a Persian rug. If you want a really good Persian rug that is handmade, it's expensive. You can get machine-made rugs that are pretty good facsimiles 
of the handmaid. But people tend to want to pay, if they can afford it, to pay the extra dollars to get handmade because there was a human who was part of that construction. Even if to the naked eye, if you're not an expert, you may not be able to tell if it were handmade or machine made. In that same vein, a number of people in the computer world have been writing about what they call algorithm aversion, which means even if the product of that algorithm, and I will talk about an algorithm generating something in AI, um, even if that product outperforms what the human could do, maybe we're uncomfortable with the result and we don't value it as much because it's not produced by a human. Okay. Back in 1970, a Japanese roboticist by the name of Masahiro Mori developed a notion he called the uncanny valley. And it was this way of describing the point at which people said, wait a second, that robotic, in this case, he was talking about a robotic hand, looks too human, I'm uncomfortable with it. So you get excited about this ability of early AI to develop, in this case, a robot hand. And you say, that's really impressive. It's really, wait a second, it's too impressive. I'm uncomfortable with it. So it's that principle we're talking about. Well, does this translate into what human beings feel when it comes to a product of AI? And some of the research has suggested that for um, things that are subjective or emotional in terms of what the task is, we tend to have more aversion than if something is objective or is more objectively cognitive. Uh, an interesting study was recently done. Again, there's the reference there if you're interested. Um, on judging the quality of writing. If you disclose that the writing was done by AI. And it turned out that for short stories, people didn't feel the quality. We're just talking about judging quality of writing. And I know that's not an objective measure. Uh, Jessica will vouch for <laughs> the difficulties of doing this. Um, but people do make judgments on writing quality. And for the short stories in this experiment, there seemed to be no difference if you said, oh, by the way, this was written by AI. However, for poems that were written in the first person that were emotionally evocative, if you disclosed that the poem had been written by AI, people would say, you know, that's not actually a very good poem. And they downgraded their notion of equality based on the fact that it was written by AI. Next slide, please. Well, where does the notion of human agency come in? And I'll tell you right now what I'm driving at, namely what creativity does for us as people, rather than objectively, does something look more or less creative? Was it done by a human? Was it not? A computer scientist at Stanford named Fei-Fei Li, some of you may have heard of her work. Uh, she was the one who created ImageNet uh, they had a competition every year, and in 2012, a man by the name of Jeffrey Hinton from the University of Toronto and his students came up with using a new kind of algorithm and using NVIDIA GPUs and uh, were able to identify images by computers better than any other team ever had been able to. And that was really the beginning of an awful lot of what we now see as um, uh, uh, GPTs. Uh, generative pre-trained transformers. That was sort of the, the beginning of what we made possible. Anyway, Fei Fei Li um, is now at Stanford. She is the co-founder of what's called the Stanford High, the Stanford Center for Human-Centered Artificial Intelligence. And one of the points that she makes is that whatever you do with AI, it shouldn't undermine what humans can do. It shouldn't undermine, undermine their agency. It shouldn't undermine their taking initiative, they're making decisions, they're being creative. Now, stepping back to a psychologist who's not writing about AI, but the principle I think is important, a psychologist named Gregory Feist, creativity is a willingness to be confused and not understand and not know. Highly creative people take pleasure in not understanding rather than withdrawing from it. So what he's driving at is it can be frustrating when you're trying to create something, but the frustration is not necessarily bad. Hitting a brick wall is not bad because along the way, you get to discover things about yourself, about what you're capable of. You can have emotional senses of fulfillment. 
And I'd like you to keep that in mind as we keep going. Next slide, please. As part of the agency question, there is the issue of, well, what does it mean to be creative? Do you, do you have to be surprising? Do you have to change the culture? Uh, or are there levels of creativity that maybe are lower down on the totem pole, but still valuable? Two psychologists, uh, James Kaufman and Ronald uh, Baghetto, came up with the notion of levels of creativity. And they distinguished four of them. The first they called mini C, which basically means you do something for yourself. Other people may not even know you did it or they don't particularly recognize it, but you get satisfaction from having done it. The next level up the totem pole is little C, where maybe you get some recognition for what you've done. Uh, you may win a local prize. Pro C, now it gets capitalized for the P, is professional recognition. Maybe you win a Pulitzer Prize, uh, you know, the Booker Prize, you know, so we'll just talk about writing, um, a National Book Award. And then there's Big C, which is a co contribution for the ages. You know, so I put in King Lear, you can fill in your favorite. It's something that now goes to those earlier definitions, uh, creativity for the ages, creativity that changes the culture, changes the way we look at ourselves. So the question is, do the little guys, mini C and little C matter? And uh, Kaufman is one person who has said, yes, they actually do. And he quotes, and I quote him, a lifetime of mini or little C creativity is associated with numerous personal benefits. So what are these benefits? Uh, some of the examples he gives are reducing your stress, um, dealing with negative challenges, saying, you know, I could actually do this. And as well, and this is me speaking, affirming that you have a story to tell. There's something inside you that's worth bringing out. Next slide, please. And now specifically to writing, talking about collaboration, choices, and challenges. Next slide, please. Collaboration. There's a huge amount of talk today. Um, I've put this halfway down the slide. The mantra is augment, don't automate, collaborate. Don't let it take it, meaning uh, AI, don't let it take over. So there's lots of collaboration of one sort or another that takes place. You may have engaged it in, in your classes. It may be used in the writing center at Amherst, I don't know. Um, one flavor is the human being writes and a GPT, name your favorite um, company, um, does the editing or the GPT writes and the human edits or you brainstorm. There are lots of things that are collaborative. There also, though, are lots of collaborations that take place with grammar and with style, and that happens behind the scenes. Guess what? When the first spell check came, that was a form of collaboration. And there's lots more now. There's a tool called WordTune um, that changes, that offers you alternative uh, versions of a sentence. Uh, there's Grammarly that I'll bet all of you know, maybe use. There's Microsoft Editor, which gives you all kinds of advice, sometimes wrong advice. I've written about that in the book. Maybe you'll find it. Um, but I will mention that these tools are especially helpful for non-native speakers and writers. And many, many of my colleagues from other parts of the world use Grammarly when they're writing articles that are going to be published in English, and they learn from them, and they turn out to be quite helpful. Next slide, please. What about collaboration for creativity? Not just fixing up your grammar or your spelling or your punctuation or getting a slightly different style to a sentence. At the recent Davos uh, World Economic Forum, there was, a session, there was a session on Gen AI, boon or bane for creativity. The CEO of Coursera, an online course company, um, Jeff um, Magiancalda had the following to say, humans with these tools, with these generative AI tools can produce far more variations in creativity along with certain themes than humans just sitting there with their own brains. And I hope you hear the sarcasm in my voice. You can decide for yourself if you agree or you don't. More interestingly to me is what um, Edward Tian and his crew now at GPT-0, which I'll bet you all know about, it started as a, a chat GPT detection tool, uh, but it's become a much more interesting tool. And more recently, they've come out with something called deep analysis. And there was a blog post that um, Edward Tian had written a couple of weeks ago in which he said, what I'd like to see is not just this tool of, of GPT-0 being used to 
um, to suss out using a GPT to write when a human claims to have written, but rather to help humans analyze their own writing. Because uh, what the deep analysis tool does is it goes sentence by sentence rather than saying, here's a paragraph or here's a whole paper that we have reason to believe was written by AI rather than written by a human. And what he says in that blog post is that you can use this sentence by sentence analysis to identify what many people have called plain vanilla human writing that's not terribly interesting to urge humans to be more creative in their own writing, whether the tool comes to be publicly available, whether it's used for that purpose remains to be seen, but it's an interesting thought. Next slide, please. Challenges. I'll start with the second line on this slide, not the first one. I've asked my students for years, what do you know when the internet is down? Think about it. These days, the question to ask is, what can you write when GPT, whichever flavor you want, is down? And that can be a problem. Okay. Just as there is fear of using um, algorithms, there's the reverse of what's known as automation bias. Automation bias is a concept that largely got developed um, in the uh, early years of autopilot, where it was clear that you had these tools that could fly the plane. And the question was, should a pilot trust that the decision being made by autopilot was the right decision, particularly if the pilot had a different notion of what should be done? And there were a number of crashes that took place as a result of pilots trusting autopilot. But the concept of automation bias has spread to other domains, one of which is the world of AI. And the question is, do you trust something produced by AI more than you trust something you produce yourself? Or do you assume that because the AI... And do you assume because AI produced it? My, my favorite way of saying this is if Microsoft editor says it's right and you think it's wrong, Microsoft paid $13 billion to open AI to develop this tool. Who do you trust, right? Um, and there have been some experiments done recently where uh, something is generated by uh, a GPT, whether it's GPT 3.5 or, or, or GPT 4, and people are given the option of making it better, making it their own. This isn't a testing situation. This is not you personally writing the essay to try to personalize it. And more often than not, people don't make changes because they assume it's good enough. Must be good enough, it looks fine to me. Why do I have to spend, why do I have to waste my time making changes to it? But there's a slippery slope here and that's what I'll be getting to. How much use of AI is too much? Next slide, please. So we make choices. We make choices when we write. We make choices to write. You've all probably heard some version of this one. I'll, I'll quote from Joan Didion. I write entirely to find out what I'm thinking, what I'm looking at, what I see and what it means, what I want and what I fear. Many, many people, I actually did a hunt to find how many, and it's, it's, it's at least a dozen, probably two, have written some version of that. Uh, Flannery O'Connor is probably best known, but George Bernard Shaw and William Faulkner, and it goes on and on and on, have all said sim similar things. That one of the reasons for writing is figuring out what's in your head, because you may not have worked it out until you look at what you've written. Right after ChatGPT came out, there was an interesting event that took place in Norway. You say, wait a second, why are we going from Joan Didion to Norway? I have my rationale. There is a union of teachers of Norwegian language and literature, you know, both for high school and college. And the second week after ChatGPT came out, they were all up in arms. They did not want students in Norway using this. Now in Norway, uh, the education system is governed by uh, nationwide by the government. So you have to petition the government in order to stop something or to start something from happening. But their argument was a really interesting one. They said, the thing about writing is it's a process. And it's not 
is the product any good? It's what did you learn in the process of getting there? And they were concerned that the process would be stymied and this would compromise the kinds of thinking that people did and the kinds of citizens they became. And they said very explicitly to compromise democracy. More recently, this is a comment from an American university student and an event was held and I borrow this from a colleague who hosted the event. He said, I don't like to use AI because it interferes with the skills I want to learn. It takes away the motivation for learning those skills. Next slide, please. So we have choices. And now I'll get to the slippery slope that I was talking about. There's an indie author by the name of Jennifer Lipp who writes books on, and she sells her books on Amazon Kindle, and she writes a new book every nine weeks. Uh, that takes a lot of work, right? And she discovered PseudoWrite. I had mentioned this tool earlier that was written by ChatGPT, that by GPT-3, excuse me. And she said, you know what? For, for finding alternative words, for finding synonyms, for writing really short descriptions, I bet I could use this and it would speed things up for me a little bit. I'll do all the hard work. But the more she used pseudo right the more she found herself going down that slippery slope and she found it right using to to write more and more of those books and she said this is from an article in which she was interviewed it didn't feel like mine anymore it was very uncomfortable to look back over what i wrote and not really feel connected to the words or ideas next slide please but lest you think i'm being only negative um, I'd like to cite a, a really interesting article by a journalist and novelist named Bahini Vara. She wrote about the fact that she had, you know, she writes a lot, and she's also curious and interested in AI, but she was having a lot of difficulty writing about the death of her sister through um, Ewing sarcoma. And she would sit down to write about it and found she just couldn't make herself do it. It was too raw. It was, it, it, it was too emotional for her. So what she did is she tried out a conversation with GPT-3. So she'd write one line and then GPT-3 would write another line and there are whole novels that are written this way um, of, of, of sort of call and response with, with an AI. And what she found is that she was able to tell her story of what she went through and her relationship with her sister by that non judgmental fellow writer, and you can put writer in quotation marks. So the final slide, please. I came up with an analogy, and you can tell me if you like it or not. A package tour is to independent travel as AI is to human writing. So you need to balance how much you want convenience against personal venturing. So with a package tour or with AI writing, you save a lot of time and effort. And if there are problems, somebody else or something else is handling them. And yes, if you do this on your own, this being either traveling or writing, um, the road can be rocky and you don't always know where you're going to end up. But making those decisions, taking those risks becomes part of your life. And by relying too heavily or too often on AI to do our creating for us, we miss out on the journey. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you so much. Um, in advance of this conversation, um, I, uh, I talked with many people here uh, at Amherst College about their questions and curiosities about, um, about AI and writing and creativity. Um, and I sent you some questions in advance um, to kind of get the conversation started here. Um, so I, I want to kind of share the um, some of those questions. I know that as you prepared, uh, Naomi, you, you've kind of put some of these questions together and teased them apart a little bit differently. So I'm just going to give a sense of what some of these questions um, are. Um, and in the meantime, um, for folks of you um, who have questions, 
uh, for Naomi, if you would start adding those to the Q&A function that you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom screen, Ari is going to be collecting those and, and bringing those into the conversation as well. So, um, uh, but let me just give a sense of the kinds of questions that we had in advance. Um, we had a question about reading, and um, I think this might be really interesting to unpack because of your um, your work with reading in, in your in previous uh, works of scholarship. Um, but the question of how our reading practices may change as we're reading texts written by AI. So. Um, you know, you you spoke a bit about um, the process of writing with AI, but then what happens when we're reading those texts and how do we change our relationship to the text? Um, how do we digest it or regard it? Um, I want to thank Christina Reardon for sending this question to me and uh, really kind of got um, some balls rolling in terms of um, these questions. So that's one well, question I'd love to hear about. Yeah. I'll start with that one. Great. Uh, the the first point I want to make, and I've, I've written about this recently, is that one of the things that AI potentially will do is reduce the amount we choose to read. Because we're used to thinking about, oh, AI could write a summary. Well, in order to write a summary, AI has to read the text. In order to write an analysis, AI has to read texts. And to the extent that we are having a tool that does the reading and the analyzing for us, we don't even have to read the Brothers Karamasa. We can just let all that reading be done by an AI, and it's going to put delve in what it says. <laughs> We're not sure. Okay, so that is the first kind of potential effect on reading that scares the bejesus out of me. Um, I've done a fair amount of work along with a colleague of mine in Norway, Anna Mangan, in how much we are reading now. And the answer is, even before um, the AI tools came along that can do this reading for us, the amount of pleasure reading that not just in the United States, but around the world that is being done is plummeting. So if we have even less motivation to read, I know this is not a, an issue for Amherst students, but it is for the world writ larger. Okay, but let's get to the the, 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 the nitty gritty of uh, the question that I think was actually being asked. Um, part of the answer to, my, to that question in my mind is how much you know about AI. So if you know that AI can often not be accurate, if you know that it can hallucinate, then if you read something and you know it's written by AI, you, I would hope, begin with at least a little bit of skepticism before you assume that what's being written is true. Now in fiction, it's a different story than it is in, in, um, in informational text. Um, there's also the question of whether um, algorithm aversion or automation bias is in your bailiwick. So the experiment that I talked about, uh, talked about evocative first person poems, but not everybody has that same response. Some people will feel if it's a short story and I know it's written by AI, I'm not gonna value it as much. You know, it's the Persian rug made by, not a, not a Persian, <laughs> but by a machine. Okay, so there's some of, there's something of the human in us that decides we're going to like it or not like it even in advance. But what if you don't know if it's written by AI or if it has human provenance? Um, there, I think we get to a larger problem, uh, which began, uh, I mean, it predates computers because there are all kinds of fallacious things that have been written and said for uh, millennia. But there was the widespread growth with the... Um, with the coming of the internet of what came to be called the death of truth. And that we are skeptical of almost anything we're seeing produced that we can't ourselves vouch for. So if you don't know if it's written by AI or by a human, even if you don't know much about AI, but you've heard a few things about it can be dangerous, it can be uh, fallacious and so forth. What I worry about is our not having any confidence in that which we're reading, either because there are, are, are claims to fact 
or claims to creativity, you know, so take take the lawsuits that are coming uh, fast and furiously being filed by authors, not just by the New York Times, saying you can't just take our stuff and pretend it's yours and to write something on the basis of it. So there's that skepticism of, you know, did, um, did Margaret Atwood actually write this or not? I don't know whether I should read it. Well, maybe she did write it. Maybe it was one of her early works that didn't get all the, the sales that her later works did. So that puts us in a very precarious position and that worries me considerably. We need watermarks as it were, although those are almost impossible to do for writing. They're much easier to do for graphics than they are for written work. Let me ask you another question that I, I got in advance. And I think this actually picks up a little bit on what you were just saying about our reading habits and perhaps directions that they are moving in. Um, and so um, I'm just gonna, I'll, I'll just read the question. Um, increasingly for a variety of reasons, but partly because of the internet effects, our students seem unable to read and absorb longer texts. Do you think the writing generativity of AI its capacities in drafting, outlining, editing, and critiquing prose or argument will have similar disabling effects. Do you see ways that these tools could support the development of writing skills and processes? So this is really about skill development and uh, kind of, I don't know, directions that you see things moving right now. All right, I'm gonna take that question in three parts, which is how I divided it up in my mind. The first part is, is it really the case that the internet has has made us read less? We were already reading less. The internet is contributing to that. We'll just leave it at that. Then there's the question of the negative effects of generative AI on our writing. And to illustrate my answer, I will allude to a cover of New York Magazine in 1970, okay? It's a picture of a, a matron in her furs with a, an estate in the backdrop and her hippie son is sitting in a wheelchair you know, with his hippie beads and, she and, and on the cover it says, she is speaking, of course he can walk. Thank God he doesn't have to. So my concern about generative AI and writing is that after a while, just as he will lose the ability to walk because his muscles will atrophy, a lot, number of people are worrying about what will atrophy, in term, including me, uh, will worry what will atrophy in our skills, what will atrophy in our motivation to write. And that's where I think we have to be really careful. You know, Think about Jennifer Lepp's uh, Slippery Slope. Um, there are all these wonderful tools that Microsoft and Google are developing that do the grunt work. And we have to decide writing, but we have to decide what the difference is between grunt work and then saving ourselves for the creative work. Because guess what? AI can produce things that look pretty darn quotes creative. All right, positive things. Uh, I think the Vahini Varas um, article in her conversation with GPT-3 gives a really good example of what by yourself you can try out without there being some human, you know, like me, the teacher saying, no, that actually is not the way to do it. Or just, this doesn't make sense. So your argument doesn't follow or, you know, whatever. You try things out. It's one of the reasons that personal tutoring, if it actually works, not just giving you answers, but stretching you to figure things out, stretching you to allow yourself to make mistakes when there's not somebody standing over you with a grade book, I think that's very important. Uh, AI can be used for productively blocking, uh, uh, you know, undoing writer's block. Okay, there's a lot of talk about this, but the question that I ask myself is how different is brainstorming using AI from sitting with a friend and brainstorming ideas? And to some extent, it's up to us how productively we use those tools in terms of making ourselves better writers. So take spell check. Uh, I did a study um, asking people over 200 people in different countries, does spell check make you a better or worse speller? And it was really interesting. I was interested to see how many people said it makes me a better speller. That was particularly the Europeans because this study was done in English and I wasn't asking specifically about English skills, but they probably interpreted it as such. Similarly with 
things like Grammarly, there are explanations that Grammarly will give you for why a particular thing was wrong. If you read those explanations, if you take them to heart, if you learn the grammar as a result, then that AI tool has been very productive. If you do what most people do, not Amherst students, <laughs> um, but other students just say, okay, just, 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 tell me the, tell, just tell me the answer and let me move on, which is what the vast majority of my students do. And I'm not saying I blame them because the tool is there just saying, you know, like, and in, in, in through the lucky guys, drink me, you know, here I am, just, just use it, okay? Do I believe that spelling skills get better for the vast majority of people because of spell check? Absolutely, I do not believe that for one second. And we could talk about that later. Okay, another question, or do we want to get to the question from the audience? It's I think Ari has a question from the audience here, so okay. we'll turn that over to her. I have, okay. a, I have a few, actually. Um, the first one, Naomi, is going to be, um, to what extent does AI resurface in your creative process in life? In my personal one or in ones? Um, <laughs> we'd have to, the, the uh, non- Okay. Uh, I mean, I'll, I'll speak for mine, yeah. and then I will um, try to envision other people's. I, I did a lot of playing around with ChatGPT when it first came out when I was finishing my book. Um, quick story, I thought I had finished the manuscript of the book in mid-November 2022. I sent it off to Stanford University Press. Um, two weeks later, ChatGPT came out. I had a lot of revision I had to do really quickly, and I tried out a lot of things. Um, and you know, as, as, as most of you probably know, in that early stage, ChatGPT was not particularly creative. It had all kinds of bumper pads and, and protections built around it um, so that it didn't spew bad stuff, and it didn't spew interesting language for that matter. Um, I think the question in terms of creativity is, what does one want out of creativity? I mean, I use the thesaurus in Microsoft Word. I would be much better served if I would rack my brain and try to think of words myself. But you know what? There was a print thesaurus around long before there was an online thesaurus. And there were dictionaries for looking up words rather than just letting spell check autocorrect for me. So the question is, how much does it matter to me? And the example I will give, and I'm sure there will be some smirks, but you're polite, so you won't do it on camera. When I balance my checkbook, I do it by hand. I do the addition and subtraction by hand, because if I don't use those skills, I'm going to lose them. It was decades and decades ago that I learned them. And then, yes, I check them with a calculator, with my pocket calculator that is now 37 and a half years old and it still works. Um, but I do it by hand, the same as I make myself do things. Can I get ideas that are creative? I'm sure I could. But I have to be careful because I don't know how tempted I can be. You know, take the bag of potato chips. You know, or the marshmallow test, if you want to be more scientific. Are you going to eat that marshmallow now? Or with the bag of potato chips, you're only going to take 10 chips, or the average serving is 17 chips, right? You're not going to eat anymore, though you've got the bag. Come on, guys. That is my concern, because then the question becomes, who are we as writers? And now we'll talk about being writers as a society. Do we care that something comes from people? And I think we do. We still go to live concerts. We started going to movies because we, you know, not just getting everything from Netflix or Showtime or wherever, or Paramount Plus, because we wanted to be in the presence of other people when things were happening. We go to, we, we go to places where people are, where they're doing things, because that's part of our human culture. And that's what I think we have to we have to balance with the convenience or what I call the law of efficiency. Yeah, thank thank you for those remarks. Um, I have another question here. Um, yes, it has a few different parts, but okay. um, the first one is, uh, what do you see as potential solutions to that slippery slope you mentioned, and how can educational institutions support students as they navigate productive use of AI? Do you see any sort of 
regulations or protections that organizations or even governments could put in place to help us with that? Okay, so let's work backwards with government. Um, the EU is doing far better work than Americans are doing or have any snowball's chance in hell of doing given our Congress um, in terms of regulations. Uh, what are the companies doing? Uh, it's easier to put watermarks onto graphics than it is to writing. That's number one. And if you're not using, uh, if you're not looking at an image created by uh, whether it's Meta or whether it's Google or whether it's um, OpenAI, but, but it's from some other um, party, then you don't have a watermark anyway. Okay, so what is it that we can do? What is it we should do? I think the most important first step is to educate ourselves about what these tools are. And what do we mean by ourselves? Largely, I mean faculties. You know, this is high school teachers, middle school, high school teachers, and university faculties. All the studies that come out basically suggest students know about AI at least twice as much and twice as often as faculty do. And it's hard because faculty are trained to do a million, a gazillion other things. All right, things like the modern, places like the Modern Language Association and the Four Cs Conference have undertaken to try to figure out, well, how do we solve this problem? I think talking with students about what the tools do and what they don't do, talking about why learning to write and practicing the craft yourself matters is important. Uh, going back to Jessica's point with, about reading, um, are there differences between reading in print versus reading digitally? I'll just give you the final punchline. Yes, there are, but if you don't tell students, if you don't tell faculty members who do book ordering what those differences are, then it's not anybody's fault that students don't have the advantages of print where print happens to be advantageous. Similarly, um, if you ask anyone in AI, will there come a point where however hard GPT-0 or all the other detection tools try to detect some, whether something is written by a GPT or written by a human, we're, we're just about at the point you can't really do that. And we will reach the point where for sure you can't do that. So, so, um, so the turn it in approaches to, jet, to, to detecting AI are gonna fail. So that will fail, government will fail, school policies will probably fail. And the reason that I say that is I spent a lot of energies both um, writing academic integrity codes and running academic integrity codes and uh, uh, meetings and all that kind of stuff. Plagiarism is gonna happen. Cheating is gonna happen because taking something from AI is not plagiarism, but if you put your name on it, it's cheating, okay. We're not gonna have a way of detecting that. And honor codes are not going to solve the problem. We know that. Places with honor codes still have cheating. Okay. So education in, in terms of why are you doing this? Somebody's paying a whole lot of tuition. <laughs> Somebody's paying taxes if you're talking about public schools. What is it you want to learn? It's not all about grades. It's not all about, because by the way, most employers don't even look at transcripts anymore when they're giving out jobs. They're looking at other things you've done. If you want to get into graduate school, that's different. But the, the notion of just trying to always make something look best as a product is not a good way to be a human being. It's how you got there. It's what you accomplished. And unless we instill that value, we're never going to get there. Pragmatically, the way to solve the problem is to work on writing collaboratively with students. And that takes a huge amount of time and effort. And Jessica, I'm looking at you again. That is multiple drafts, sitting down, brainstorming, talking about why this works, why this doesn't, having students talk about what they're trying to accomplish. It's really clear. You can't do that if, if AI wrote it for you. Having universities being willing to invest in the resources to make that happen only happens at a very, very, very small group of schools. And unless that happens more broadly, we're fooling ourselves when we say, there's a 20 page research paper and there's a five page essay each week. And the vast majority of people who are not writing or you know, comp and rhetoric teachers are not reading them anyway. And that's been true long before AI came down the pike. I've been in this business too long, sorry. 
<laughs> so it, it takes a commitment. It takes an acknowledgement. It takes education. And it takes thinking about what do you get out of writing? How do you benefit from it? What's going to last with you over the years? And until we take those as values that we that we instill in people and we have them question and say, okay, for this, I don't care, but for that, I do. And to be honest with ourselves, um, it's going to be um, a foolish game we're playing with ourselves. I think with that, we will, um, <laughs> we will thank, thank Naomi for her wonderful words and, and, you know, all the perspectives on writing and creativity. Um, Thank you for your questions and for um, joining us today. Thank you, Jessica, for your questions as well. Um, and please subscribe to um, Isla's newsletter for information on future events like this. Um, yeah, thanks everyone for coming. And I thank you all for the chance to, to share with you my thinking and your thoughts with me. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs>